Hello there, I'm Tyler Griffin, and this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, 2 Nephi chapters 11 through 19. This is the first uh, half, or a little more than half, of the big Isaiah block of chapters that we cover in the Book of Mormon that often people come to and then stop, either skip and jump ahead or stop reading altogether and then start over in 1 Nephi uh, down the road. Our goal today is to give you some tools, some principles and practices that you can use to make it so that when you come to the Isaiah passages, you can get excited instead of uh, shying away from them. The biggest factor is to put on Hebrew symbolism lenses to take off the Greek literal lenses that we often live our lives seeing everything through those, the, those literal uh, lenses and put on instead these symbolic lenses and looking for layer upon layer upon layer of symbolic meaning and not missing the bottom line, the, the main point of Isaiah's symbols, which are always going to be rooted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, it was back in 1 Nephi 19.23 when Nephi had been reading the books of Moses, probably out of Exodus, to his brothers, and they weren't getting it. And so, in verse 23 of chapter 19, he said, So, I did read unto them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah. And he did that, that he could more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. So, Isaiah is a Hebrew poet, he's a Hebrew prophet living in the kingdom of Judah, a hundred years plus before Lehi and Nephi leave Jerusalem. And so he's telling a story of what's happening in his day and his age, his age but as a seer, he sees things past, present in his own day and future, and all things that he writes are going to point forward to Jesus Christ. So, one of the biggest lenses to keep in mind is keep the Savior as the main focal point when reading Isaiah. The other lens is to keep you and your world in focus and to bring those two together to find greater depth as well as breadth and meaning in life. So let's jump into chapter 11 and see the reasons why Nephi gives us as to why he's going to read or record so many chapters from Isaiah. In verse 2 he says, Now I, Nephi, write more of the words of Isaiah, for my soul delighteth in his words, for I will liken his words unto my people, and I will send them forth unto all my children, for he verily saw my Redeemer, even as I have seen him. So, Nephi is invoking this law of witnesses. Isaiah is an eyewitness of, of Christ, the Redeemer. And I am, he, he's adding himself to the list. And then he adds verse 3, and my brother Jacob also has seen him as I have seen him. So, now you get three witnesses. And in the halfway down in verse 3, he tells you, by the word of three, God has said, I will establish my word. So, Nephi is saying, where the three of us have seen our Redeemer. We're not just giving you what we believe or what we hope to be true, we're telling you things that we know because we've experienced them. And there's something powerful about the gift of special witnesses, whether it's in Scripture or in modern days, where God has chosen certain individuals and given them certain privileges to be able to now go forth into all the world and to bear testimony of the name of Jesus Christ and to, to teach the things that he would have them teach. And then he tells us that, uh, verse 4, my soul delighteth in proving unto my pe people the truth of the coming of Christ. You understand that he's going to read a whole bunch of chapters from Isaiah, but it's so that the bottom line, the foundation, the root of why he's doing that is so that they can know the truth of the coming of Christ. And then he says one, takes that one step further, for for this end hath the law of Moses been given. 
and all things which have been given of God from the beginning of the world unto man are the typifying of him. So you can get excited about whatever interpretations you want of any scripture, not just Isaiah, but any scripture anywhere. There are lessons to be learned at multiple levels, but his point is this is the fullness of the intent of, of everything that has ever been given by God from the beginning is to typify of Christ. So in all of our zeal and our excitement to teach any lesson about any doctrine or any, any principle of the gospel, if we miss the Lord Jesus Christ as a foundation, then we missed the mark. We either looked beyond it or we didn't look far enough. So principle number one, jumping into our study, don't be afraid of, of putting on these Hebrew symbolic lenses and trying to learn a new language, basically, and recognize that fluency doesn't come in an instant. It takes time. You have to spend time immersing in these words. And you can read lots of books that people have written about Isaiah, and that'll probably be helpful to one degree or another. But honestly, my biggest recommendation is full immersion in the words of Isaiah themselves in the scripture. Just start reading them, pleading with God to help you, and keep reading them. And just like learning a foreign language, you'll find that all of a sudden things that used to be confusing will start to make a little more sense. You'll start to understand what he's trying to say, and you'll see more layers of his symbolism and the repetition. Um, at the very end of chapter 11, you'll notice verse 8, he says, Now I write some of the words of Isaiah, that whoso of my people shall see these words may lift up their hearts and rejoice for all men. Now these are the words, and ye may liken them unto you and unto all men. There's that second le uh, lens, liken them unto you. Find how you and the Savior come together through these incredible words. Words that, quite frankly, are very unique in Scripture. There aren't very many prophets that we have been commanded by the Savior by name to search diligently these words. So you can find that in 3 Nephi chapter 23, verse 1 through 3, where the Savior is commanding those Nephites and Lamanites to search diligently the words of Isaiah. So. Instead of being discouraged, if you don't understand, smile and be grateful that we have the opportunity to keep digging deep and studying these words and know that you're fulfilling actually a commandment of the Lord when you search diligently. Don't read casually. That wasn't the command. It was to search diligently. It's gonna, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves, metaphorically speaking. You're going to have to dive in and do some things that maybe you, you haven't had to do in other passages of Scripture, and that's a good exercise. Now, um, a couple of other items of consideration before we dive in regarding some tools, some Scripture study techniques to, to not feel so confused when it comes to Isaiah. We've already talked about he's a Hebrew poet, and Hebrew poets speak using symbolic repetition. So they're going to try to teach you things using stories, metaphors, analogies, objects, scenarios, case studies, but they're very symbolic in nature and they don't usually teach you using just one symbol. They'll repeat another symbol. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's this symbolic repetition using these things that people would have been very familiar with back in Isaiah's day. And if we pay a little price, it won't be hard for us to make these jumps to understand how they liken to us today. So, the second thing to remember is because he's such a powerful and inspired seer, he can actually teach you a history lesson from his day, but teach it in such a way that applies to things from the pre-mortal realm, to Adam, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham, people who came before him, as well as to Jesus Christ's day, as well as to our day, and these prophecies can be fulfilled across multiple times, not just his own day. 
and H. Keep in mind also that his book in the Bible has 66 chapters, and chapter 1 through 39 is largely about what happens when people break the covenant with God when they decide that they are smarter than God, they know more than him, or they don't need him anymore, and they stray from the covenant. So this is a scattering where they're leaving the covenant. And what are the judgments? What is the justice? What, is, what, what happens to these people when they break that covenant? Chapters 1 through 39 are focused on the consequences of leaving that covenant connection with God. Then, and, and keep in mind, the whole thing in chapters 1 through 39 isn't all doom and gloom. There's some hope mixed in along the way, even as they're, they're struggling. Then, in chapters 40 through 66, you get this beautiful gathering effort of God, where he brings people back in there's great hope, there's great redemption, there's, there's solution to the problems. So the phrase that gets repeated over and over in scriptures is, I will be your God and you will be my people. Oops. So what happens when people say, no, I don't want you to be my God, I want money or a career or the pleasures of the world or sports or anything else. It doesn't matter what else it is. I want that to be my God. Well, then we stop looking to the God of heaven for our, our revelation, for direction, for guidance, because we don't want his guidance. We want to enjoy the things of the world. And so, what you see throughout these Isaiah chapters is this, this interplay between what happens when people break or what happens when God reestablishes and reconnects that covenant and gathers people in. Every time you sin, you're scattering to a degree. Every time you repent, you're gathering to a degree into that covenant. So, you can liken all of these scriptures that, that were big and on a, on a national level in Isaiah's day and in his writings, you can actually liken them on a very personal level to you or your family or your ward or a, a sm much smaller group of people. It's, it's beautiful. And Isaiah is deep enough with enough layers to be able to handle the, uh, those likening efforts that we bring to it. So, let's dive in to chapters 12 through 19. We're not going to do all of them. I'm only going to give you a few examples as we go through of this idea of how the entire set of chapters is trying to connect you with Christ. It's trying to help us come into this covenant relationship with him and trust him to be our God, not anything that the world has to offer. So you'll notice that chapters 12 through 24, they all come from this first section of Isaiah. It's chapters 2 through 14, which are in this area of where Israel has broken their covenant. They've been scattered. They're going to face all kinds of, of judgments of the nations around them. There's going to be some hope mixed in, some deliverance mixed in, but they're struggling. So, that is the section that we jump into when we begin in chapter 12, which is the equivalent of Isaiah chapter 2. He begins with a temple text. There are few places where you will more fully be able to demonstrate, I want thee to be my God and I want to be my, thy people than you can in the temple. So, he, he talks about in the top of the mountains, the house of the Lord, the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob is going to be established and it's there where he will teach us of his ways as opposed to the ways of the world. It's there where we connect with him. And that applied in Isaiah's day. It applies to the second temple period at the time of Christ 
and it applies beautifully in the dispensation of the fullness of times when we have hundreds of temples. And it's hard to keep, keep up with them, them as they're being announced and built and constructed across the world. It's such a beautiful fulfillment of Isaiah's uh, writings here. But again, it's not about the temples. It's not about the bricks and mortar. It's about seeing them for what they are, which is a symbolic connecting point between you and heaven, between us and Christ. It's a place to go, not just for ourselves, but to become more like the Savior, to turn outward and do for others those things which they can't do for themselves, to become saviors on Mount Zion, and to be able to acknowledge once again, I want thee to be my God, and I want to be thy people. Then he goes to, to the last half of chapter 12, he gives the contrast. What happens when a people says, no, I don't want the temple. I don't want God to tell me what to do. I want to live my life the way I want to live my life. And they set up their own idols. They worship their own gods, created and fashioned after their own making. He tells us that there will be incredible destructions brought to the earth because of that covenant breaking and because of that scattering that they have chosen to do for themselves. And after that destruction, verse 18, it we're promised that the idols shall utterly be abolished. And then the people who have spent their time and energy and devotion and given their money and their, their life to these idols, after the idols are destroyed and the kingdoms of the earth have been destroyed, then these people are going to run and flee into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord shall come upon them and the glory of his majesty shall smite them. So what are they going to do? It says in verse 20, the man in that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which he hath made for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. So taking off the Greek literal lenses, putting on the Hebrew symbolic lenses, you then say, hmm, why would he symbolically repeat moles and bats? Bats who is going to be the recipient of these idols that a few verses before were seen as our God, as a people who have forsaken this covenant. Why would we throw them to moles and bats? The Hebrew poetic symbolism here is remarkable. Isaiah picked two animals who do most of their work in the dark. The moles underground and the bats above ground, but usually they're active when it's really dark. And most people would consider them blind, even though they're not completely blind, but they, they rely very little on their sight, which means when a mole or a bat comes across a really precious idol made out of gold or silver, He's not going to see it for any value. It's not going to look any different to a molar bat than, it, than a normal smooth rock would look to them. They can't tell the earthly value or the, the, the worldly uh, value attached to that idol. Hmm. I wonder, I wonder if you can take that symbol one step deeper and say, who is it that was really blind? Is it the mole or the bat? Or is it the people who chose to devote so much to this thing that they crafted, that they built and then worshiped it? Where's the real blindness here? Brothers and sisters, the invitation from Isaiah is to take off these blinders, to, to remove the hardening of the heart elements and to come into this relationship, this covenant connection with God and say, I don't know what I need to do, but I will trust in thee. And as an outflow of coming into that, you now get all of these covenantal promises from him that he'll bless you with land, with possessions, with uh, priesthood power, with posterity. And yet we live in a world today who is willing to, to turn in all of those blessings for other things because they're blinded by the craftiness of men to pursue other things rather than this 
covenant connection with the God of the universe who holds worlds without number in his hand and is mighty to save and is able to give us all these blessings. Now, chapter 13, you get some more examples of this covenant connection that helps you see Jesus Christ and you as you liken these to your day, not just understanding them in their historical context, which is very important, but also figuring out what it means to us today. So in verse 1, 2, and 3, you, you get this idea of Jerusalem and Judah having been disobedient, and so what does God do? They have the stay and the staff removed, the whole staff of bread and the whole stay of water. Those life-giving elements are removed in the historical setting by Babylonian conquests and before that the Assyrian conquests and other wars that they had experienced. They, they literally lost their, their access to water and bread during times of conquest. But isn't it amazing to liken this passage to our day and picture what happens every Sunday? He gives you the stay in the staff, bread and water these covenantal connections where you are allowed and invited to come and have table fellowship with the Lord and not just renew all of your previously made covenants, but to make a new covenant with him every week. Every week you sit there when that sacrament is, is being administered and passed and you are making a new covenant saying, in essence, at the core, I want thee to be my God and I want to be thy people. Please forgive me and please help me to be a better instrument in thy hands in moving forward. Chapter 14 is a beautiful chapter of hope that God doesn't leave them desolate even in the scattering. He gives them hope that there will be a day when they can return, if they choose, into the covenant. And you can see that as you study chapter uh, 14. Chapter 15 you get the Lord comparing the house of Israel to a vineyard, very similar to Zenos' allegory in Jacob chapter 5, where he says, I've planted this vineyard. You are my trees, you people, the house of Israel. And verse 7 says, the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. Once again, a symbolic repetition. Things come in, in couplets, in pairs. He looked for judgment behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry in the hebrew those words are so close judgment mishpat oppression mispach oppression is uh what these people are returning in exchange for god's goodness and his his righteousness that he gives them and so he's begging them to just trust him come into the covenant take the words that he's given and return that, that beautiful justice and judgment that he offers for righteous living. Do the right thing, but instead they're oppressing and they're causing people to be hurt, including themselves. The cry isn't just what they're inflicting, it's what they're inflicting upon themselves in the process. And so the rest of that chapter, you can see all of the, the woes and the captivity that are brought upon a people when they say, no, I'm smarter than, than God and I don't need him to be my God. Chapter 16 is an outlier because it's, he, Isaiah stops speaking in, in his prophetic symbolism uh, Hebrew poetry form, and he just shifts into narrative form where he's telling his own story, his own calling as a prophet, in, being in the temple, seeing the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. It's his throne theophany, his prophetic call, and it's beautiful to see how when people are struggling, what is God's pattern? he calls a prophet from among them to then go and be his messenger, his emissary. So look for those, those elements in chapter 16 and what's attached to that prophetic calling. And then you might consider comparing it to the prophet Joseph Smith's calling or our, any one of our prophets today, how God follows this exact same pattern. 
And then chapter 17, there's incredible opposition. You get the two countries north of Judah, so Israel and Syria are joining together, becoming confederate, saying, we're going to go down and destroy the kingdom of Judah. Well, Isaiah's alive at that time, and all of the people in the kingdom of Judah are saying, oh no, what are we going to do? And chapters 17 and 18 talk about what do you do when you have massive opposition, when fear is knocking on your door, when it seems like a conquering army is coming to destroy you. That conquering army is probably not going to be a, a Syro uh, Ephraimite combined army coming to lay siege. That's not our story. But it might be a loss of something. It might be a child with incredible special needs. It might be a loss of job or a loss of health or a loss of a home or a loss of mental health. It could be all kinds of different uh, oppositions that are threatening to come. And if you read chapters 17 and 18 and 19 through that lens of what do I do when opposition is coming, then you'll find that you're not probably going to understand everything you read in its historical context. Do the best we can to understand the geography and the history and the culture of that day. But we can at least find application for our day. And it's this idea of letting go of our loftiness, our haughtiness, our pride, and being humble enough to come to the Lord and say, not my will, but thine be done. What would thou have me learn from this uh, opposition that's coming upon me? How can I be strong to stand up where I need to stand up to the opposition? What do I need to do to fight against it or to adjust so that it doesn't destroy me? And that story is going to look very different for, for everybody as you work with the Lord in that process. There are so many experiences in my life where I've had to let go of what I thought or what I firmly believed and where I've been taught powerful lessons and sometimes it comes in, in strange ways. Let me give you one example. Many years ago we were living up in Cache Valley in Utah, up in uh, Providence, and it snows a lot frequently in the winters there. And one particular day it had dumped feet of snow. And so, being trying to be a good father, I took my two little boys at the time, my two oldest sons, Benjamin and Jacob. Benjamin was, I think, a deacon, maybe 12 years old, and Jacob was about 10 or 11. And I was going to teach them. So we loaded some snow shovels in the, in the car, and we carefully drove down and started shoveling some walks of some uh, single sisters in our ward and it was heavy snow and it was a lot of work and I was exhausted and we were all done and as we're driving back up the hill to get to our house I can't even remember which one of, which one of my children it was but one of them said hey dad we should go and shovel Norm Christensen's driveway as well and I thought oh my goodness Norm he, he lives up on the hill he's got a young couple that lives in the basement they're fully capable of shoveling the, the driveway for him, and he's probably already got it hired out if his tenants haven't taken care of it. There is no reason we need to go and do Norm Christensen's driveway. And uh, my two boys said, Dad, we should go anyway and just see. I think we need to go and shovel his walk. And I was exhausted. I felt like I had already taught them everything I needed to teach them about turning outward and being service-oriented. And they insisted. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to show you guys. We're going to drive up there and we're going to see his driveway and I'm going to show you that it's going to be done. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm confident. So we did. We drove up and turned the corner and there was his driveway completely filled with snow. Nobody had touched it. So they excitedly jumped out the door and started shoveling. And we got partway through when Norm Christensen came out the door and he was emotional and he said heaven brought you to my driveway today 
I was like, what are you talking about, Brother Christensen? And he said, the, the tenants that lived in his basement were gone for the weekend. He had called everybody he knew to come and shovel the snow and he hadn't been able to get in touch with anybody and he had a doctor's appointment later that morning and there was no way he was going to be able to get out and he was worried sick. So he said, I went and I prayed. I pled with God to send somebody to shovel my driveway. My two boys heard that and I heard that and I was thinking, hmm, <laughs> here I was trying to teach a lesson to my two boys and God taught a lesson to a prideful father in that moment through the example of his two boys who were receptive to a message from heaven that their dad hadn't received. It was a beautiful moment to remind me yet again, if I want to be God's people, I'm going to have to let go of some things, some idols, some ideals, some expertise that I have in order to embrace those beautiful covenantal promises that God offers. To finish, it reminds me of the chorus of a, of a moving song that was uh, sung by Nathan Pacheco. Here's the chorus. What if it's in laying it all down that we finally receive? What if it's by surrendering that we show that we believe? What if it's in letting go that we're really holding on and that we finally see that he's been there holding us all along? Brothers and sisters, as you jump into Isaiah, into your study of Isaiah, don't be afraid. Let go of the past anxieties or the past frustrations with Isaiah and just embrace these chapters with fresh lenses looking for the Savior. Every symbol will point you to Christ and you can liken all of these symbols to you. You don't have to be an expert in history. You don't have to be an expert in biblical Hebrew. You don't have to be an expert in geography. You can find lessons that will help you more fully let go of the things of the world and say, Dear God on high, I want thee to be my God, and I want to be thy people. That's my prayer for all of us as we move forward in our study of Isaiah this week. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. Thank you.